sweet. <laughs> yeah, Sonic gets in that I don't Can get started soon? I think so. We'll start in just a few minutes. Let me make sure my phone is up. Yeah, he's in the restroom. Phone is off. Oh, nice point. So I think Claudia is going to give a quick update for the yeah. TPF. Yes, Claudia. Well. Uh, well, no, no, no. I, you know, just yeah, explain it to the crowd. Good evening, everyone. Good Welcome evening. to the People's Forum. Yes, you could clap. <laughs> Bring the energy in as we welcome um, Eugene and Mala um, and Simon. My name is Claudia de la Cruz, and I am a member of the collective of folks that have put together the People's Forum and operate this space. We want to warmly welcome you all. Thank you all for being here and making the time. Um, for, for us, is an honor to be part of this event and be able to put forth this conversation, which is a very important conversation in relationship to anti-imperialist struggles worldwide as a space that is committed to deepening and strengthening relationships among social movements that is committed to internationalism. We understand that what is happening in Ethiopia and what is happening in the Horn of Africa is a result of a history that is rooted in neocolonialism neo and imperialism as a space that is committed to building relationships that are relationships of liberation. We are very happy to have you all here and we are way more excited about the possibility of leaving this space and continuing to have these conversations with people outside of the space. The hope is that folks leave this space committed to continue to bring forth the information that is the right information to our people because we know that the mass media is doing completely the opposite. We understand that we have a responsibility as people who are living within the United States, which is the empire, which is the biggest violator of human rights, and who does not have any moral authority to speak about human rights, to sanction any country, or to be an obstacle to the process of unifying the working class internationally, we have the task to demand from the United States government that they stop any type of intervention, be it economically, be it politically, be it ideologically, in any part of the world. That includes Ethiopia, that includes any country within the Horn of Africa. We have that responsibility. We must say no to US imperialism in any corner of the world, yes to the unity of the working class, and we must actively work to make that happen. So we are very grateful for the Answer Coalition, for the New Africa Institute, for involving us, engaging us in this conversation, and we look forward to more conversations like this and our continuous work, work to dismantle U.S. imperialism around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think my task is to pass it on to Simon. <laughs> I have completed my task, comrade. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. <clears throat> I see so many uh, wonderful faces here tonight. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we have to our right here a beautiful coffee ceremony. And uh, we, we are very thankful for this space being opened up to us um, by the People's Forum. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, we have two excellent guests. Actually, I should also say all the wonderful co-sponsors uh, of this event. Uh, we have BT News, uh, Breakthrough News. We have uh, the Answer Coalition, as well as the New Africa Institute. Um, and so uh, hopefully this will be a very useful, very productive educational event um, and will spark more conversations about um, what's going on in the Horn of Africa. And so with us today, we have two amazing guests. Um, we have Eugene per year to my right, and we have uh, Hermela Aragawi to my left, and I'll uh, give them the mic so that they can introduce themselves and just tell us a little bit about yourselves. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm the first victim yeah. here. Uh, well, no, well, first and foremost, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, old faces, new faces, everyone, it's good to be here, and it's good to have at least a brief opportunity to talk some about what we did with Breakthrough News. As Simon mentioned, I'm Eugene Perrier. 
I'm one small part of our Breakthrough News team. There's a few other people <laughs> sprinkled throughout here and at least one other person who was on the trip with us who's actually working right now, but will appear at some point, so I'll, I'll shout him out. Um, you know, we've been around for a little less than two years at Breakthrough News. This has been an issue that I, you know, we've started covering, you know, really in the, the second half or the sort of middle of 2021. And I think having the opportunity to go for six days to Ethiopia, and I think it was about four days in, in Eritrea, and to see more of what was happening in the Horn of Africa was, you know, really crucial and key for us. So, you know, that's a little who I am. I'm here with Breakthrough News. I'm a journalist. We were just there in the Horn of Africa. There's many other things I could say about myself, but I don't want to go on and on and on. But very excited to be here in this space. Very excited to be here with Hermela. And I think that in the context of this entire you know, tragic state of affairs, it's been notable the people that we have met and uh, you know, really converge with along the way and people who you never knew existed, but who you find and have a lot of uh, uh, you know, similar similar thoughts and thought processes and now are involved in similar struggles. So honored to be here, honored to be a part of this and very happy to really talk a little bit about my trip and some of the broader implications coming out of it and you know maybe a little bit more about what the future may or may not hold. All right, I guess I'm the next victim, huh? <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Hermel Aragawi. I'm, there's usually a screen in between me and the people, so <laughs> this is sort of a foreign um, concept uh, to me, but I'm an Ethiopian-American journalist. I've worked in what you would call mainstream media for the last 10 years. Um, was pretty frustrated with the way the Ethiopian conflict was being covered. Um, I think this is a great forum for people to be able to engage in person. I know we don't get this very much nowadays. And I'm so honored to be on this panel with Simon and Eugene, who I, st I learned so much from about Ethiopia. Um, he has such in-depth knowledge of the context, something that I had to play a lot of catch-up on. Um, what I love about this time, and like you said, it's based on tragedy, but it's bringing people together that wouldn't have otherwise come together that have shared values, not just shared nationality or culture. And I think that is the future in this global world when you're talking about social issues, to be able to go outside of your community and find other communities that are going through something similar. Imperialism is very real, apparently. Um, I, I, just what I've learned about how much influence the West can have in a country like Ethiopia is astounding. Um, I don't think the problems would be as big as they are if, if that involvement wasn't there. Um, and so yeah, I hope this panel is insightful, we hope to get questions at some point, um, just sort of trying to think about how to move forward and think more solutions uh, oriented and I think it's amazing that Eugene and Rania were actually in Ethiopia and went to Eritrea, I haven't done that, so um, just to be able to talk to someone, not yet, um, so it's amazing to be able to talk to someone that was actually there because the only reporting that we see is either Ethiopians that are there who are not necessarily or Ethiopian media who are not considered equal in the eyes of those in the West, or mainstream media that's doing reporting from uh, you know, Kenya or from remote um, that is actually making the conflict even worse by its biased reporting. So I'll stop talking and uh, get this conversation started. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I forgot to properly introduce myself. I'm Simon Tesfamerio, uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm representing the New Africa Institute, the executive director there. And um, so today, um, I thought we could start off with um, just kind of getting an idea of what prompted you mm. to go, you and the BT crew, to head down to Ethiopia and after that Eritrea. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the question. I mean, I think it was a combination of things. I mean, you know, first and foremost, there is a lot you can do in terms of covering something, learning about something, reading about something, uh, getting a general sense of what's going on. But to not be able to have any sort of sense of what's happening on the ground obviously creates limitations. So we knew we weren't going to necessarily be able to be the end all be all to get every single thing, to learn every single little detail, but that the opportunity to go sort of you know, after all of this coverage, we felt we owed it, one, to our audience to help give people more of an up-close, in-depth look at what's happening. We wanted to get some sense for ourselves of some of the things that 
we sort of know existentially, like for instance, you know, one thing that's already been mentioned, and I think one thing that's relevant is the impact or potential impact of sanctions and what that is going to mean for people on the ground. And certainly for those of us at Breakthrough News who have covered this issue in many different ways, we know whether you're talking Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, whatever, it's usually the average everyday people. So like who are those average everyday people who are being affected and what can we learn and what can we also transmit to people here about what the real impact of US policy is going to be? Because that sort of putting a face to a name is a very important thing. Like it's one thing to say the US is going to remove Ethiopia from eligibility in AGOA. There are many things you could say about AGOA, but it means some people could lose their jobs. Well, who are those people and what's the impact on their life? So to the extent we could get that story and bring that story forward, to the, also the extent we could just get a general sense of what's happening on the ground, talk to who we can talk to, get the stories we can get. Um, for us, was super important for a range of reasons, but particularly because I think inside of the way the conflict has been covered, I probably not lost on anyone here, that it's been extraordinarily one-sided. And that even to the extent that there is sort of another side acknowledged, it's very rarely revealed even from a scratching the surface kind of way. So to the extent that we could have the opportunity to also be in places and do reporting on elements of the story that aren't getting on CNN, that aren't getting in the New York Times, that are often being dismissed by those outlets in and of themselves and treated as lesser than, that felt like it was also an important opportunity for us. And then I think, of course, you know, something similar goes for Eritrea, which has been referenced constantly in the conflict, um, but sort of in a shadowy way, um, as this sort of evil, shadowy influence behind the scenes, manipulating things, and you know, this sort of black hole of a country in terms of what is known about it and what's said about it. And so for us to be able to demystify at least some element of that, if we had the opportunity to at least try, was important to us. So that's what really was important and what brought us at Breakthrough News to want to do this on, re honestly, relatively short notice, uh, without a lot of planning, for a limited number of days. But I think that we were able to see a lot, do a lot, be around the country, and get at least some sense and tell some of these stories. And I think what you'll see over the coming weeks from our reporting is, is just that. So I <laughs> okay. So I think now would be a good time to talk about some of the places that you and Rania went to in the Amhara region, places that were impacted by the war. What were some of the things that stood out to you in terms of stories and people and um, just sort of what was happening there at the time? Yeah, well, um, and Rania, I think, is actually watching this where she is in Beirut. So I don't know if you're in the chat or whatever, Rania, but maybe say hello. But vir virtually, I'm sure I can say hello for you. Um, yeah, I mean, we saw a lot. I mean, and a lot of things stood out. I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, kind of like from the start, a lot stood out because for those who have been following it, you know, the U.S. Embassy is like in, I think even still now, in overdrive telling all U.S. citizens to like leave the country immediately. It's extremely dangerous. You know, just like a week before we got there was, you know, Otis is about to fall at any moment and street fighting and this, that, and the third. So I don't know that we really had any belief that that was true going into it. I think we already were questioning the narrative. But it's one thing to sort of question the narrative and say, well, this seems like this is not legitimate. And it was a whole other thing to get there and it to be you know, the exact opposite of what was said. I mean, there certainly was, there was just no wartime atmosphere whatsoever. And it was such a dichotomy from what we were seeing even then at that moment from the US Embassy in particular, from the State Department over and above anything else, that it felt like almost like a, a metaphor for the conflict overall. So obviously there are many parts of the country that are dangerous and where there was fighting going on, but it wasn't in the outskirts of Addis. So even that just right there is something that really still stands out to me because it's like, okay, kind of from the time we arrived, you can see the dichotomy in the narrative narrative that's there. But I mean, the things that probably stick with you the most are, you know, the worst things that you see and you hear. I mean, you know, we were able to go many places in Amhara State. Unfortunately, we weren't able to make it to Afar. Uh, you know, we were some of the first people to get to Lalibela after it had been retaken. Uh, we were in Gashina, we were in Chenna. So we were just hearing the stories of people and asking them, you know, what was happening here. I think people probably saw, for instance, a lot of the footage that was coming out of the airport at Lalibela that the airport had been basically trashed. And, you know, we were asking local people, well, what happened at this airport? And they were, you know, telling us, well, you know, this and that happened, the TPLF did this, they did that. And then in the course of that, they were like, oh, you know what else is they were also, they trashed this medical center. And we were like, oh, really? Uh, Maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, but we were a little surprised to hear that. So then they took us to this place and they showed us certainly what had been a very destroyed 
medical center. And they told us some pretty harrowing stories. I mean, you know, many different things that we heard, but even just what you could see, and even when you can see, think of the impact in and of, your, uh, in and of it yourself. I mean, imagine your pharmacy completely destroyed, all your records destroyed, all your medical records basically destroyed, what that will do just in and of itself from the point of view of, of rebuilding. And we also heard about, you know, terrible consequences. This is what people are telling us, at least, in terms of what happened by having a lack of medical care in the context of being there. So, I mean, many of these things really stand out to you because you can see the human impact, you know, talking to people about just their stories of what was happening in the time that the fighting was happening, when the TPLF was in places, and the stories we're hearing are, you know, summary executions, uh, you know, summary beatings, the trashing of people's homes, the stealing of people's food, uh, and, you know, pretty consistently we're hearing this in, in town by town, place by place, and, you know, also sort of seeing that consistency in and of itself sort of says something, but also just in general seeing the impact that it had obviously had on people. I mean, a lot of places we'd been, you'd see like sort of things were starting to come back to life in a sense, in the sense that commerce, people are coming back who had fled and so on and so forth, but it was so fresh. I mean, most of the places we were, it was been like two days to two weeks of having you know been retaken from the TPLF. So there was very much also a feeling of, you know, this isn't over, we're not fully out of this, you know, it, in many places very tense. But long story short, I mean, I think those are the things that really kind of stick with you because these are the stories that you're not surprised to hear, right? I mean, obviously we've heard quite a bit. It is a war, so you're expecting you're gonna hear harrowing things. But I think to really be there, to hear it from people, and then to see maybe in a way why it affects you so much, is how one-sided the coverage of it is, and how it seems like the suffering of these people really counts for less in the context of the conflict. And you know, even seeing Ned Price say the thing about if the un is the spokesperson for the State Department, if the unconfirmed reports of destruction in these places are true, we're you know whatever condemning it. And it just thinking back on that, it's like wow. So like, what does it take to be confirmed? I mean, obviously none of us were like there. We didn't see it happen exactly. But it seems like if it happens in one area, no matter how little evidence, it's a hundred percent true. But if it happens to people in Amhara and Afar and other parts of the country, then it's unconfirmed. It's not true. It's not this. And so not only hearing the stories from people, but getting a sense of how they're they're just valued in a lesser way really does stick with you. And I think that was uh, an important part of it. No, you go. Otherwise, I'm going to keep talking. The, so. No. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the the president, the leader of uh, Kenya, uh, Uhuru, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, Kenyatta, and uh, he actually famously said, uh, you know, that these foreign correspondents, he called them John Whites, reporting from Nairobi, Kenya. Reporting from Nairobi, Kenya. Unlike them, you actually visited. Um, what is the message that you have for you know these folks who are first of all to the mainstream media, um, these correspondents who are sitting in Nairobi, not going there and not doing their job, finding out these stories of these individual these these uh, these victims, um, and then um, to the viewers of the mainstream media. Um, we know that BT, we know that Mela Media, others are doing great work um, uncovering the truth, and so. Um, what are some of your thoughts in regards to the mainstream media narrative? What, what, what message do you have for them? You, well, I mean, it's maybe the same message I've had for the mainstream media going back to the Iraq war. I, I mean, it's that you have to cover the truth and you have to cover it from a perspective that recognizes all of the ingrained biases in US media, which is towards the perspective of an imperial agenda and foreign policy. And I think people have to question, you know, why I mean, you would just think sort of propriety's sake that you would have reported this a little bit more even-handedly if the, if the press was the free press that it claims to be. And I think the fact that it isn't means that you can see that the mainstream media is unwilling to deconstruct its own biases, but I don't expect it to. So I guess in a way, I don't know if I have any message for them uh, because it just sort of seems like it's what I expect. I expect a very reductive approach to almost all major conflicts that exist on Earth because that is the way that they cover everything, whether we're talking about China, whether we're talking about Latin America, whether we're talking about Iran, whether we're talking about the Horn of Africa. I mean, it's pretty consistent that the same sort of reductive narratives with the same sort of ingrown biases are relatively and consistently brought to the forefront again and again and again. So I think that really my maybe point is to consumers of the media to take everything with a grain of salt, to do as much research as you can. I mean, it is possible to go there. I mean, having been there, it's not easy. It's not the easiest reporting you'll ever do. 
if you're just in, but I don't think you also have to wait for the media. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, I think that over the history of many, th many things in this, I mean, you, I mentioned Central America. I mean, the role of people to people diplomacy, the role of people going and seeing for themselves and making their own media, which in the age of social media is more popular, possible than ever, I think is also valuable. So I think people doing their own research, doing what they can to find out for themselves when and where they can is also crucial and important. And you know, consuming a wide range of sources critically, that's sort of what I would take from this. But I think you can't take anything in the mainstream media as the gospel, that's for sure. I think you have to be critical. Um, okay, so we know that the mainstream media has been pushing um, you know, a very pro-TPLF sort of agenda. Um, and so w you've heard the stories of these victims of TPLF. Uh, what message, uh, I mean, what, what, what sort of message are these people telling you about TPLF and the ethnic divisions that they're creating? What, what, uh, what is the sort of the, con what do you see as the long-term consequence of this? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's one I'm honestly kind of wondering myself, really, what the long-term consequences could be because it, you know, I mean, really, when you look at the context of this conflict and the way that it's been waged, and certainly what we heard from people, it, just taking that at face value, it really more or less has a feeling that it's kind of like, well, if we can't run the country, then no one else is going to run the country. And we're going to do everything we can in the most divisive way we possibly can. I mean, obviously talking to people in Amhara and asking them, okay, well, what were your experiences under the TPLF? And they're describing a range of abuses and also describing that some elements of that were directed towards their ethnicity. Well, you know, once the war is over, what is, what is the long-term impact of that? What is the long-term, what are the different divisions and distrust and things like that that are sowed or amplified or whatever it may be? I think that's a big question hanging over all of this. And I don't think that it's just a, a you know, totally, uh, you know, set in stone kind of question. I mean, obviously also when we were there, one thing that happened in Addis is that there were thousands of Tigrayans who were opposed to TPLF who were demonstrating. Um, so obviously it's not just, I think, a one side fit, you know, one size fits all, a one sided story. I think the way that it's often presented, which also reminds me of the Middle East to some degree, is like, well, there's a lot of divisions that go back a long time and these people are just fighting and there's nothing that can be done about it. I don't wanna have a fatalistic view of it in that sense, but I do think that you know, there's no way to go there and to be there and to see everything that's happening and not think that to some degree, part of the war aims, at least from what, we're heard, what we heard and what we're seeing, seems to be to try to, if they can't win the war, leave as many dangerous fault lines and landmines in the society as possible. Because I think we have to remember and always remind ourselves, I mean, this is a force that ruled the country for 30 years, that was sidelined within its own coalition. I mean, forget the broader society that was also rejecting it, and decided to then launch a war in order to reinsert itself into a leadership position in the political process. So obviously, they're willing to create massive destruction, millions of refugees, a worldwide global crisis in order to make sure they have some role in governing. So I think then it's sort of that in and of itself sort of comports with a lot of what we were hearing from people, which is that it seems deliberately destructive and deliberately designed to sow discord in the population and to try to make it difficult as possible for places to rebuild, make it as difficult as possible for places to have healing and national reconciliation and all these different pieces. So I, I don't want to say 100%. I don't know how much any of this is going to affect anything. I don't know what the long-term reality is going to be, but it does seem like there's certainly an effort to make the tensions as high as possible and as destructive as possible. Possible. Yeah, and I think what I would add to that is I think that's the evil magic in this all, right? Like it will create the scenario that it declared in the beginning, even if that wasn't the case. So if you say genocide and you tell the people there that there is uh, another group that's trying to eliminate you, they're trying to exterminate you, they're not hearing any other media, they're not hearing any other alternative uh, ideas, then when they go into these regions like the Amhar and Afar region, it doesn't surprise me that there is that sort of savage, for a lack of a better uh, word, behavior because um, it's just human nature. If you feel like you're in danger and you've been told that if you don't take them out, they're gonna take you out, uh, then naturally after a year of hearing that, because you gotta remember, folks there are not hearing anything different. They're watching Tigray Media House, Tigray TV, and I've watched those segments. They're so eerie, they're scary in the tone of 
The Amharas are trying to take you out. They're trying to take you out. You gotta go get them. We're fighting for our existence. And there's not, a lot of these people are not educated. They're not able to, uh, to you, you know, to see other sort of alternative ideas to even be able to say whether that's real or not. So, and then on, on even like beyond that, so some of the detentions in Addis, right? Some of those people are gonna be innocent. So now there's new victims because the federal government is on high alert because about six weeks ago we were hearing that the TPLF was about to storm into Addis, right? That's terrorizing for a country that has said they don't want this group to come back. Um, and so what happens? The government goes on high alert, a lot of people are detained, um, there's limitations to, in, in terms of the conditions of jails, they probably weren't that good to begin with, now they're overwhelmed with all these people because the country feels like its existence is, um, is at threat, right? So now you have new victims, and then you have the diaspora. There's families that are splitting up because the, they, don't, they can't agree on the truth. Right. Right, I, I, I myself, um, you know, have come into challenges with my brother. It's sort of a public thing, so I don't mind mentioning it. I mean, it's like it's the closest thing to a kid I have, right? So, uh, it, we were so close, and yet when it comes to this, we can't really see eye to eye, and we we're able to work through that a little bit after some time. There was a question I put out um, on Twitter because an AP reporter, a uh, Habesha AP reporter, wanted to do uh, a story on the impact on the diaspora that never got printed, not surprisingly, because it's AP. But um, I asked a question, who has had family relationships or friends that have been strained by the, this conflict in terms of the, the, the narrative of this conflict. I got so many emails and Twitter messages, people saying their husband or wife of 20, 30 years that they have kids with is not talking to them. Um, they're not talking to their kids. Their kid is not talking to them. So now you have a third layer, uh, an umpteenth layer of impact that is very real. So you have families that are breaking breaking down. Um, you have friendship circles that are breaking down. So for me personally, the majority of my friends I would say were just Ethiopian. Uh, there's people I was friends with for 15 years. I didn't even know what ethnicity they were until 2018. No lie. Um, so for me, I, I never uh, completely ignored all my friends that I was debating with. So when my sort of thought process and evolution, seeing that the mainstream media was really trying to sow divisions and was telling a one-sided story, I was able to maintain those friendships or go back to those friendships. Not other, some, some people didn't do that. They split off from their friends and they went all the way into the sort of Tigrayan activism um, group. So a year later, can they, they feel like they can't go back to their friends. So they kind of stick to the same narrative, right? So just sort of bringing it back full circle, yeah. the evil magic of it all is almost no one will be untouched or unscathed by this conflict, whether mm -hmm. you live there or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there'll be a lot of work in terms of rehabbing relationships, like, you know, it really sort of rethinking how we talk to each other about this. How do you mend those friendships and those uh, family relationships? How do we advocate for folks that are in detention for too long and talk about some of those conditions without co-signing what TPLF is doing, also recognizing what the challenges of the federal government um, is. You know, one of the things I noticed with mainstream media is they hold the Ethiopian government to a standard that they would not even hold the U.S. to, yeah, right? Sure. So if there is an armed insurgency in this country, forget your civil rights, right? That's basically out the window. Uh, they wouldn't be talking about people in detention for too long, et cetera. And, so, and we have a much more sophisticated system if we wanted to do it right. So it, it, ultimately, I think we will get out of it. I am optimistic. Um, I think that you know, there'll be some egos. They'll just have to be put to the side uh, to make that happen. But it's, it's, I mean, there's just the impact is all over the country and also just beyond into the diaspora. Did you, did you like see this, what she's talking about on the ground? I know there was allegations of, of sleeper cells. 
where people had been living um, <clears throat> side by side with their neighbors, uh, you know, Tigrayan, uh, you know, neighbors, and right almost as like as though on cue, when you know they're coming into town, the sleeper cells awake, mm -hmm. and and so this actually we know this happened in Dese and Kombolcha and other places which are multi-ethnic and filled with different types of people, so um, all kinds of uh, ethnicities. So um, is this something that people talked about on the ground, or did you, um, you know, wh what was the vibe or the sense that you got about? these ethnic divisions moving, like the, 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 the differences between the groups because of things like this, like these sleeper cells. Mm -hmm. and um, Did they tell you the, these stories? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that it was sort of a topic that kind of is overhanging the whole country because of what had happened in Desi and in Kombucha, and I think that a lot of people were definitely talking about it. I mean, not everyone, of course, I mean, most people talking about it probably hadn't experienced it, but you could get a sense of, the sense of fear that it had put in people. And you could certainly get a sense in places that had just recently been retaken that there was a lot of, it was very tense. It was very tense kind of at all times. And I think a lot of that was because of the fear of we don't really know what is out there. We don't really know exactly who is there. I mean, I think obviously in a way, that's the nature of that kind of combat, right? And I think that was sort of the whole point of what seems relatively uncontested in Desi, I mean, again, I wasn't there, but it seems pretty clear that that is what took place. And I think that even just the fear of it happening in and of itself was something that was definitely palpable. And I think the fear that sort of TPLF could come back at any time, are they really gone, especially when it's places they've only been gone for a few days, I think was linked to that. And there was certainly a level of vigilance um, even in places that have been retaken for two weeks with sort of a feeling of, well, you know, you never know what might happen at any given time. And so definitely I think it was a definite, it was a, it was an undercurrent in the whole trip really. And I think it was an undercurrent in how people are thinking. And I think it speaks so heavily to what you're saying about sort of the creation of a self-fulfilling prophecy by doing things in a certain way in order to create a certain level of fear amongst people. And that in and of itself becomes a weapon of war. The ability to use fear um, to, to, you know, undermine the, the sort of quote unquote base areas of those you're opposed to to get people to turn on one another. So yeah, it was definitely a big undercurrent in terms of what it was. I, I can't remember off the top of my head and we would have to go back and we'll see through some of the stories if any people spoke specifically about it in some of their towns, but certainly it was something that sort of people were concerned about and the idea of retaliation was certainly something that people were concerned about in different places. The feeling that someone might see you or someone might hear about you or you, know, you don't necessarily want your face on camera because who knows who might come back and get you. So I do think that was a big, sort of that sense of fear and that sense of tension, certainly all over Amhara State, was big. Now, in other parts of the country that had not really been close to the war, it was very, very different, and you didn't really get a sense. Um, in some ways, you wouldn't even get a sense there, like if you dropped down from Mars, that there even was a war. So, I mean, that's kind of the other element of it is, I mean, it's a very intense, very serious war. There's no doubt about that. And the places where the fighting is going on, it, I won't take anything away from how devastating it has been. But I also think that, and this is part of the sort of State Department piece and some of this general rhetoric around, well, there's a civil war ripping the country apart. Uh, you know, that in and of itself, there are very different feelings in very, very different parts of the country. And in some places, like when we were in the South talking to farmers, farmers on a farmers cooperative, you know, they were talking about how they're trying to raise more crops to help meet the food deficit in other regions because of the war. So they're connected to it, but in a very different way. So that was also, I will say that since being in Amhara, being in Addis, you got more of the sense of tension, more of the sense of possible fear, certainly from those places that have been under TPLF occupation, that it could come back, that they could come back at, you know, perhaps any moment, um, but in other parts of the country is a little less. So yes, it was definitely something that overhung the whole trip, and it was definitely something that I think is on people's minds and on people's lips. Thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, very useful here, um, given your uh, background as a journalist, you're both journalists. Um, you're an Ethiopian journalist, Ethiopian American journalist. Uh, you're the real journalist. <laughs> I'm new to this, five years. <laughs> um, and you know, you, you have a very famous story um, that has made you honestly wildly popular, like one of the most popular folks, I, judging by Twitter followers, you started off somewhere, you know, maybe 10,000 or whatever it was, and now you're at like at somewhere. So my whole point, the reason why I Wait, say Wait, hold on, Will, are you, you gotta go? I just wanna quickly say Will Whiteman, who is our creative director at Breakthrough, he's the cameraman on the whole trip. He worked very hard. Woo! Stayed up for 30 hours one day. 
So definitely to, to do the work, Will's key part of the team and has already been working on some stuff, so we've got a lot coming. But no, definitely want to recognize Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Will. Uh, so um, I think, you know, your story is quite a remarkable one. And I was hoping that maybe you could just give us a little bit of background about how you sort of um, uh, have come to the position that you're in today from a journalist perspective and covering this story and understanding what's going on and also um, sort of, you know, uh, you famously said it on BT News that, you know, you're kind of forced to become an activist in this world because of the fact that um, the the journal the re, the mainstream journalists are not doing their job. So maybe just give us your story and help us understand how you came to understand everything you understand today. So you know, there's that saying I forget who it was. I didn't choose this life. This life chose me. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it, that's what this feels like. So um, I am of Tigrayan descent. Both of my parents are from Tigray. I grew up in a really apolitical household. Uh, we didn't talk about ethnicity. We didn't talk about politics. My mom is super into education. Um, the reason we came to this country is so that she can get her doctorate. She was on a scholarship, and it changed the course of our entire lives, my brother and I. Um, so she made it a point to not talk to us about politics and. We grew up with folks of not just all kinds of Ethiopians, but from all over the world. The University of Mississippi is where she got her doctorates. It's a very international community. Um, and so you can't tell me that your ethnicity or race corresponds to a value. Like, you, I've just seen so many different versions of it. Um, or gender, for that matter, or any other sort of identity that you don't choose. Um, I know that there are good people in that group, there's bad people in that group. Um, so when this war broke out, it really went against everything I'd ever known um, in terms of, wait, what? People hate Tigrayans? Like, what? I d that, that, did not, that does not reflect the life that I had lived. So, but my mom happened to have been in Tigray. She lived in the United States for 26 years, had just gone back a year prior to the war to work with the university there, help them with some research um, projects, et cetera, et cetera, sort of like give back. Um, she grew up poor. She grew up during the last war uh, uh, and was separated from her parents in Tigray because of the, um, the I guess, the, the, the opposition wars against the Derg, et cetera. So, um, so because she was in Tigray, I was paying particular attention, right? I, was, I didn't know what was going on. If it was a genocide, then it, it, it didn't look good. And so I was super engaged. I started working with some of the activists um, because to me it was a humanitarian cause. Um, I knew it was a war. The federal government was calling it a law enforcement operation. There was this debate about whether there was that Northern Command attack or not. You didn't see that in any mainstream media. I've been in the business for 10 years. Of course I've seen bias, um, and I've been frustrated with it um, in my own work, but I, broadly speaking, respected the work that CNN or New York Times or AP did, broadly speaking. A lot of the holes um, in the beginning I attributed to maybe context, right? Like maybe they just don't understand the context, the language, et cetera. Um, but over time, I started to see a sort of pattern of ignoring certain things, sensationalizing other things. The activists that I worked with um, were, had photos and videos of certain things that had happened, really gross atrocities uh, that were supposed to have happened, and they would be looking for journalists to send them to. Um, and then next thing you know, I'll see a piece in CNN about some sort of massacre. So I, I saw that relationship between the activists that were sending the photos and videos during this blackout um, and then what was showing up in the news. Um, and, it, you know, I, I worked on local news last with a CBS LA. One local story takes you about the whole business day to do right. And you're rushing, like you're trying to make deadline. So when I saw, I think the first thing was in CNN, uh, was it, was they, they might have been the first to do the Aksum massacre, um, or it came out Amnesty and CNN picked it up. 
I thought, how did they get all this information corroborated so fast in a communication blackout? They had pictures of people, names. Um, and I first saw those reports on the activist uh, Twitter pages. So I, I remember Alula Solomon and some of the other folks would send or put out names and pictures of people that had been indiscriminately killed. They would say, and I thought, okay, like I'm gonna hold off on sharing that. But when it showed up in CNN, I was like, well, I mean, it must, they must have done the work. So over time, it takes time. It took me time to see the holes. In the beginning, I thought, okay, that's possible that that's happening. But when you see in June when the federal government declared a ceasefire um, uh, and after that the TPLF did not declare the ceasefire, and we find out later for two or three months that Tigray militias were actually in the Amhara region, and Nima El Bagir, who's supposed to be the Ethiopia conflict expert, doesn't even mention it. Now I know it's intentional, right? So even within, while I was working with the activist, I think if you ask some of them, they always probably knew like I was gonna defect, okay? <laughs> because I would have questions and I would say, you know, people will say to me, TPLF hasn't done anything wrong and I, said, and I would say, come on. Like it's a government that ran the country for 27 years. It's a minority government at that. How are you going to hold on to power without doing some stuff wrong, right? So, and then, and then there'd be certain approaches that I would, I would push back on um, and so, ultimately, I started, like, I, I would always kind of dance in and out of the activism. Because I would go in, I would go hard. If you know me, I'm kind of a loud mouth in a sense. If I'm opinionated, I'm opinionated, <laughs> whether I'm wrong or not. But at, at the time, you know, I would, I would start working with them, and then I would start, sort of stop and really reconsider and reflect. I would say something on social media, or I would, I would share the, uh, some massacre stuff. I would you know, I would engage um, in some of the ethnic stuff myself, and then I would fall back because I feel kind of bad, and so there was a lot of self-reflecting that was happening along the way, and uh, it was probably around April or so when I just really started to disengage, um, and then in June, or for, I'd say like a couple of months there, a month or two, uh, people would say, why are you being silent? Why are you not talking about the Tigray genocide? And I just wouldn't respond. Um, and so it was, I would, say, I would say to my mom and a couple of my friends, you know what, I feel like I have to say something. I said so much on what appeared to be a propagandized narrative. I feel like I have a responsibility to say something. And I would sort of go, ah, just, just leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone. Um, when in June the, the, the ceasefire was declared, I said to my, I retweeted that, I think from the AP, and then I said, now will be a telling time. If the TPLF does not declare a ceasefire, then we know what this was about. They didn't declare a ceasefire. There was a lull in the reporting for a couple of months. And then one BBC article documented some huge fight between Tigray militias and the federal forces in the Amhara region. And one side said 6,000 died on, their, on the other side, and then the other side said 4,000 died on the other side. That's 10,000 lives, one article. Like, if that happened, 9-11 happened, obviously not the same thing, but if you look at the numbers of the people that died, every year we commemorate it, as we should. But 10,000 and there's one article, nobody blinks, they just move on. And then I think, um, so the moment, the moment I, I actually had to, or I was sort of like catapulted into the public space to talk about it again, was Ethiopian New Year. So I had just put up Ethiopian flag, New Year. And that to people was, you're supporting a genocidal regime, you're pro-genocide, and like some people I knew had worked with. And so it, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, my silence is actually consent, really, in, in a sense. I thought that they would sort of see that I'm not talking anymore, and maybe was, like, they would adjust their thinking or the activism. I would talk to a few of the activists um, and the ones that I sort of believed could do better and would say, you guys have to tone down this rhetoric, saying shitopia is not going to help anything. Um, and, and so when I got that sort of response, then I, 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 I followed up with just being like, asking some questions I've been wanting to ask. If you guys are saying no to war, then you should also, or have been saying it all along, then you should say no to war when it's moving into other regions. Um, 
just because I use this flag, it's the only Ethiopian, internationally recognized Ethiopian flag. It is Ethiopian New Year. It does not mean I consent to the suffering of one group or the other. Um, and that was, you know, <laughs> I'm sure if they, if they knew how much worse it would get, they would probably just let me have that moment. Um, but when I did that, I was in a group chat, uh, group chat with some of the, uh, the, the activist folks and just people in the community. I think they, for, they forgot I was in the group chat. And, and one of the people shared the post and said, uh, used some choice words. She's saying we're expansionists, unfollow her, said a bunch of other things. I waited for a minute and I said, hey, I'm here, by the way. <laughs> like, some, someone else actually said, I think she's in here. And I said, yeah, I am in here. So that sort of aggressive response, and then let me fast forward because I could talk about, forever about this. Once I started becoming more vocal, they started a petition to get me fired from my job, saying I'm pro-genocide. And that should let you know how, <laughs> I mean, anybody can be pro-genocide at this point, right? If you just ask a question, um, then you're pro-genocide. So it really puts into question the genocide narrative if I can be pro-genocide. So ultimately, um, it's just all a, a set of things happened, including me being outspoken in the beginning um, that made me feel like I had a responsibility to speak now. And honestly, as a journalist, like I'm shocked at how bad some of the reporting on the mainstream media is. I really didn't think that they were so obviously getting it wrong on purpose. Like, and that's sort of the awakening for me is just realizing everything I thought I ever knew about any other foreign country, if I picked it up from CNN, New York Times, or AP, I probably have a very warped idea of it. I worked with Al Jazeera America for a few years here in New York. We covered a lot of international stories. And now I go back and think the way that that was framed was probably incorrect, just because I know it's incorrect on the Ethiopia conflict. So long story longer, um, that's sort of the, the route that got us to this, to this point. No, I think that's a really good point. One thing I just want to add to is because, you know, when we were there, um, <laughs> you know, we actually got a lot of, of criticism from different pro-TPLF actors about, oh, well, you see who they're letting in the country and they're only giving visas to certain types of people who are going to say certain things. Well, I can say for certain, when we were there in Amhar, in Lalibela, like right there where the war was, AP was there, AFP was there, of course, MBS from Uganda has been there and was there a couple weeks before us. So this idea that like no one can get into the country and the government is just keeping out all journalists and things like that, well, if that's the case, then why was the guy from AAP and AFP all, we were all sitting there at the same place getting like the, uh, you know, whatever, uh, the pieces of paper that you need to go out and to see things. So there's a lot of willful ignorance that's going on. There's probably individual people who are struggling to get visas. I, I won't doubt that because people who have been aggressively criticizing and taking the TPLF line, you can see how that could happen. But mainstream media is there. They can get in. They're on the ground. We were seeing them. We were talking to them. Um, they saw us, they talked to us. So the idea that somehow it's like a closed off space, that no one can see anything or can find anything, we did not find that to be true. And certainly we did not find ourselves to be the only media in the areas that we were. We were some of the first to get there, but we weren't the only ones. And these mainstream outlets, many of them were around. So I think just the idea, I think they're trying to now kind of cover their coverage by saying, well, we were able to get an X place, but not Y place. I think you should take a lot of that with a grain of salt. And certainly, again, just to reiterate, there was mainstream media there where we were, right? So, you know, when the AP covers it and you feel like they didn't say something that was one sided, it wasn't because they're, or that was both sided or whatever, it wasn't because they weren't there. Yeah, and it's, you know, <laughs> it's, if there's, if they're not go going there or there, they're still writing about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I notice, uh, especially the New York Times' is Declan Walsh and, the AP's uh, Cara Anna, I don't think either one of them have been there during this conflict from what I understand. They literally write the same story over and over again. Declan Walsh just recycles the same story that justifies um, you know, the, what, what the TPLF did when they attacked the Northern Command and started the war. So they don't even, 
from their angle, it seems like they don't even need to be there. They don't need to talk to anybody. They have this op-ed piece in their head that they'll just keep writing over and over again. I spoke with a doctor that was at Eider Hospital, which is in Tigray, in the capital city there, um, extensively about what he saw, because he was there through all the way until June when the, when the federal government um, pulled out, so and a year prior to the war. So one of the things he would say is in terms of the rape cases and the rape issues, he said, yes, there was a slight increase. Obviously, this is one doctor, so take it with a grain of salt, but it matches what a couple of other folks that are familiar with that region um, have said. So he said there was a slight increase in the number of rape cases, and we did get allegations of like gang rapes that um, involved some of the troops there. Um, but he said, but those were overly exaggerated and sensationalized. So he said reporters would come to the hospital or would be stationed outside of the hospital and they would talk to them about some of the cases and the women that they talked to and they were so clearly looking for an angle. Um, and they would be, dis the doctors would be disappointed in the stories that ended up in the, uh, in the mainstream outlets because they were using um, certain data to make it seem like, I mean, it, this, this is all out there. Tigray had a very gross record of rape to begin with, right? And so you add war to that. Is it going to get better? Of course not. It's going to get worse. And the fact that, you know, <laughs> from the TPLF's narrative, which is a mainstream media narrative, not one Tigrayan has raped during this conflict. It's not possible. It's not possible that a society that had a certain social issue, all of a sudden that goes away. So I also wonder if some of the victims, this is, uh, are, you know, something happened to them for sure, but are they being told, could it have been a, a Tigrayan man, right? Or could it have been a Tigrayan militia? And they are not able to say that. Because if you say that, it goes against the narrative that the TPLF is pushing and they have that region held hostage, right? So, and, and I want to, connect this back to um, something we touched on with Ned Price, where he, where he called some of the issues or the, the atrocities reported on in the Amhara region unconfirmed. It was Human Rights Watch. They believe Human Rights Watch when it's about Tigray, so why not believe it when it's about the Amhara region, right? But what that does, it's so dangerous. It really speaks to the denying other people's pain. That is a vicious cycle. So in the beginning when this war started, um, and I was very vocal and I was sort of debating with my friends, they would say, where were you the last 27 years? Like a lot of bad stuff has been happening. And because to them, I was not vocal about their pain, they didn't have to care about my perceived pain, right? They cared that, they, they cared that my mom got out safe, but beyond that, they didn't really need to, they, they weren't open to hearing anything about some of the atrocities that happened in Tigray. And the same is true when you uh, deny what's happening in the, the, the Amhara region. What happens is eventually the circle goes back to Tigray and say, well, why should we care? You guys didn't care um, when it was happening in Tigray. And so you go into this sort of like cycle where nobody, be nobody believes anybody else's pain but themselves. And so they essentially by doing that, you co-sign things that happen to other people. There was a Tigrayan woman I interviewed recently. She's, um, she's married to an Eritrean and just sort of talking to them about how they're navigating this conflict. They're actually an amazing couple. I can't wait till we post the interview on Monday. Um, and one of the things she said is, you know, I would talk to my, because she's traveled across the country and she's a doctor and does, done a lot of healthcare work there. And she said, when I, you know, back in the day when I would talk to my Tigrayan friends about some of you know, the abuses that had happened to my Oromo friends or some of those stories, they would say, nah, I don't think it's that bad. I think they're exaggerating. And then I bet you those very same people, if you're talking to them about anything that's happening in Tigray, are going to say the same thing, right? So it's really important to be open to the idea when a group is telling you that they're suffering, you have to be open to the fact that maybe they're actually suffering. And this also applies to Tigray. I have no doubt people are suffering in Tigray. The war started on that turf, so of course they're probably going to be the number one victims of it, at least in the beginning, right? So it, it, it just really, when you politicize suffering and you get into the habit of denying others suffering, you re-victimize people and you create more future victims, if that makes sense. Great. Um, I think, um, you know, we can continue down this line of, uh, with the, uh, the issue of 
TPLF and the Tigrans, but I know I want to just uh, just kind of shift over to a couple other things that you saw while mm -hmm. you were um, in the Horn. Um, I know that you you went south um, and you had a chance to go into the Oromia region. Um, there were allegations that um, you know OLA was strong and was going to be you know joining up with TPLF to um, you know, basically get them into Addis and all this other stuff. And so what was your perception, what was your interpretation of the situation in Oromia um, in terms of its views of the government, its views of the people's views of uh, um, OLA, and just the general, the conflict, the broader conflict? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly, you know, in the, the parts of Oromia we were in, it was it was much more relaxed in a security sense than it was when we were in Amhara. So that in and of itself sort of says something, right? Because there was no doubt that it was like a war zone in Amhara, that things were happening there. The TPLF had been there. They'd been fighting between the Amhara Special Forces, the military, and everywhere you went, there's a lot of checkpoints, all these different things you would expect in an armed conflict. You know, we drove from Hawassa all the way in Sudama, all the way back up to Addis, so through a large part of Oromia. It was I don't want to say the exact opposite, but it was more or less, it, you wouldn't have thought there was anything warlike going on there. That's all I can say about that. So it's certainly in and of itself, and then you combine that with Addis itself, which was allegedly sort of partially under siege, right, by the OLA and by the TPLF coming from different perspectives. And again, there was not a military, like if, you, if you're expecting that someone has like the power to do all sorts of you know military assaults, attacks in a city around somewhere. You know there's going to be the military is going to be everywhere. People are going to be rushing around. People certainly aren't going to be like out doing things and so on and so forth. And in Addis, you just got the sense of like basically everyday life. No more security than you would expect in any major city. I mean, you know I see more cops on an average everyday basis in New York City than I saw on the streets of Addis Ababa. Um, so you know none of that really comports with the fact that there was like a major insurgent threat to the city there. Certainly coming up through Romeo from the south, you didn't get that same feeling. We weren't in the whole region, of course, but all I can say is everything sort of we saw and all the places that we went in that regard, it certainly seemed to give the opposite impression of the impression that there was some major uh, you know, OLA force that was about to seize the capital or that all of Aromia is you know, totally out of control in some sort of massive war, insurgency, civil war type situation. You don't get that sense. You certainly didn't get that sense where we were. So I think that you know, that's one of those issues that in some ways I'm not 100% that qualified to speak on, but I think that obviously when you put together a lot of the different sort of facts on the board, I mean, the millions of people in Aromia who did vote for Abiy Ahmed in the election. The fact that many of the traditional political parties there have fractured. The fact that it obviously seems that from my point of view, at least in some parts of the region, there is not a sense of conflict. It certainly leads one to believe that a lot of the narrative that um, is being put out there, at least by the TPLF, of course, which is that all the Romos essentially are backing them and that they're you know, gonna also rise up with them and overthrow Abiy Ahmed, seems to certainly not be true at all. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it goes back to that self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say that your government's falling, so many people are against it, so many people are against it, people start to lose faith in their government, right? That, which I think is the, the tactic of the, uh, the U.S. I mean, if the uh, glorious day in D.C. where they had the Federalist representatives um, do a press release, if, if anyone hasn't seen this, what it was was these, I think, nine folks who were supposed to be representative of minority ethnic groups um, in Ethiopia that were on the side of TPLF and against the government of Ethiopia. So those nine guys had no idea what they were talking about up there. But I did catch this, or they did say this in a way that made sense. We are here to announce that we are going to overthrow the government of Ethiopia. Like, who does that, right? Who does that in the United States? Reuters was there. New York Times was there. They essentially legitimized this announcement of a violent coup, right? So, and, and it turns out, first of all, nobody knew who they were, right? People were like, who are these people? Like, we've never heard of them before. <laughs> But it was creating this sense that there is a strong, unified opposition. And, and not surprisingly, you saw like the, the camera guy or the audio guy fixing someone's um, 
audio and he has the Tigray flag on there, right? Like so obvious who orchestrated this, right? And so it, it's, it's just creating this sense that a TPL left is not on their own, that there's a much more uh, division in the country that there really is. Um, and I don't know if the West was always this sloppy. Maybe you can tell me because you have a much more deeper understanding. But it almost feels like the, the lie on Ethiopia is like made for Africa. Like they don't think it needs to be that complicated for Africa. Like, you know, because with other stories with, you know, when I was with Al, uh, Al Jazeera America, Syria happened, uh, there was the, the summer of Gaza, a, a lot of stuff was happening in the 2013 to 2016 years. And it seemed like their lies were more sophisticated than they are for Ethiopia. Um, and I think that whole show in DC was, was uh, exemplary of that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just going back to the, the, the faking dissent mm -hmm. and faking the sense that there's, there's more um, issues than there are in order to get people to lose faith yeah, and in their I, government. I think that, yeah, I mean, I think that so much of it, I don't know if they've always been, but it's, you know, the whole dark continent narrative about Africa, right? Uh, that it really is just a bunch of savages with no history, no culture, no civilization. And of course, people in Africa are killing each other. I mean, it's why in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you could have one of the most devastating wars really in history happen in you know just the past couple of decades, millions of people killed. And it, that I don't know if that's almost ever been a front page story in the United States. I mean, it's always just a completely back page story that's just sort of a side note and a footnote because that's what we're told to think about Africa. And I think this is the case, and I think it is reductive. I mean, you know, again, I, I, I'm not saying I'm the ultimate authority on all these questions, but when you get a sense of being there and you certainly get a sense of what's happened since 2018, you know, it's pretty obvious to me that a lot of long-term questions about the history of a region where there's a lot of shared history and a lot of contested history. And there's a lot of questions about how you should be structuring a government and how you should embrace and, and address the issues of diversity and unity and how they come across. But I think that you know, it is deeply reductive because it's almost as if any form of dissent if it's not with the TPLF, it's not relevant. You know what I mean? And there's not a deeper conversation about the broader political differences that are happening. So certainly you get the sense when you're there, I mean, that there are a lot of differences that people have, and there are a lot of different political tendencies. The vast majority of them have decided not to start wars to try to destroy the country in order to get what they want. And I think that you know there's a difference between a, a conversation that I think is opening and that is happening and that has been happening in a bigger way since 2018 about what the future of the country is going to be. That could go many different different ways, and I think that's often just reduced down to this sort of typical dark continent Africa, people fighting each other, no real need to really get into any of the context of what's here and what's there, and it makes it easier for people on any side really to caricature what's happening because there's such a lack of knowledge and it's so easy to sort of say that all of this people are for this and all of that people are for this and so on and so forth, and it didn't really strike me as that cut and dry in the context of what's happening on the ground and in the context of what we've seen happen since 2014 when the mass protests started the sort of process of sidelining the TPLF inside of Ethiopia, and I think it's raised a lot of interesting questions, and I think a lot of conversations we had with people are about you know, some of that contested historical memory, some of the realities of what has happened and what does that mean going forward, some of these dialogues. I mean, what does it mean to have a dialogue between many people in Ethiopia and Eritrea after this historic peace deal? I mean, that's a question about the future. It's a question about the past. And I think a lot of these things that are happening and ongoing, there's a lot of an attempt to sort of impose a, a reality of it's definitely this way or it's definitely that way. And you know, I think being a little more circumspect is, is certainly warranted. Yeah, and I just want to add the, to the point about stereotypes. It seems like, to me, mainstream media just recycled like a 1980s, 1970s playbook for Ethiopia. It was crazy. For 20 plus years, gradually you start to hear more positive news about Ethiopia, fastest growing GDP in the country, da da da. And then now I look back at that, some of that is true, but knowing what I know in terms of the role of the mainstream media on this conflict, I also have to look back at that and say, why were they emphasizing all the good stuff for 20 plus years and the reports about you know, torture and human rights abuses were like here and there kind of hidden in certain um, human rights organizations' reports. When they're talking about, first of all, the fact that war happens in Africa for a lot of people is just like, ah, yeah, an, an, just another war. That's what Africa does. 
That's not true because if it wasn't for uh, the West's involvement or the imperialism force, this war would have ended a long time ago. It was started from within, but it was really fanned and flamed by the mainstream media, the international community, um, all of that. And there was a point um, when they were talking about famine and starvation, which of course everyone's like, oh, Ethiopia, famine and starvation. Like, a lot of people don't question it, right? But how did we go from the fastest growing GDP in the country to now with like this savage genocidal government, we're starving again, like somehow. Um, and what you notice is this reporter, this AP reporter who uh, was writing about starvation in Tigray, used this picture of this little boy, I believe it was, that was starving on um, a, a tube. She said he was at Eider Hospital in Tigray, which is the capital, but the photos uh, provided anonymously. I know from our work you can't do that. You can't write such a big story and say you got this picture like out of, from an anonymous source. First of all, if you're talking to the hospital in that region, there's no reason why you can't get a photo that's sourced from the hospital, right? And then so it made me think about how news gets into the uh, the news cycle. Okay, so an activist sent you that picture and they told you it's a starving boy at Eider. And then you created this narrative because nobody's going to question it because Ethiopia, starvation, famine. The other point to that is, you know, they're always talking about the blockade, the government's blockade, because, right, it's a savage, genocidal government and they're trying to literally starve out a, a certain population um, of, of their country. But you don't ever hear that the aid that went in was redirected for war. Literally, there's two UN officials who are on record in a leaked audio and a piece written by Jeff Pierce that say, one of them was the chief UN um, mission in, in Addis, who she's supposed to be in charge of controlling how the aid gets to Tigray, etc. She said, the director of WHO, who is a TPLF member, Tedros Adhanom, was overstepping the mission in Addis and working with the insurgents and rebels in Tigray to basically take control of that aid. And then you would see over the course of a couple of months, July and August, trucks, like UNA trucks, you could see the logos on some of them, moving Tigray militias into the Amhara and Afar regions. This is on Tigray TV and Tigray Media House, so they're telling you what they're doing. So if you care so much about starvation, famine, etc., and you are claiming this blockade, you should be just as outraged, more outraged, when you see that you aid agency trucks are being stolen by the rebels, right? So you don't actually care. You just want to reinforce the stereotype. In fact, you are ignoring the very things that would actually cause starvation, right? So, and then to, to take this beyond Ethiopia real quick, and I'll stop talking, is, I now have to question, because we had a panel recently, Simon was a part of it, a Middle East reporter, a couple of Haitian journalists, uh, Margaret um, Kimberly of Black Agenda Report, and listening to Elijah Magnair, who covered the Middle East, I now have to stop and, be, and, and question the fact that I sort of have uh, uh, accepted the fact that the Middle East is always at war. Because they make you think the Middle East is just always destined to be at war. Because I've seen it done in Ethiopia and how much influence there is on the West to keep things a certain way, I now have to question my sort of stereotype thinking of other regions, right? So media is so powerful. That's why I went into it. I think the kind of work that Breakthrough News is doing is so important. And over time, I would like to see what's called the mainstream media, CNN, New York Times, AP, that are given such credibility and platforms become the alternative news form. And then everyone else that's trying to get it right be the mainstream media. I'd like to see that too. Um, hopefully, we'll see. Uh, keep up the great work. Um, and so we also know that you had a chance to visit Eritrea um, right after Ethiopia. We know that Eritrea was drawn into this conflict uh, by missiles being fired um, you know, by TPLF on Asmara. And, um, you know, Eritrea was also recently sanctioned. Uh, brutal, tough economic sanctions. And, um, you know, you had a chance to kind of visit and see uh, what the realities are there. We hear that, you know, the media says it's like one of the most horrible places in the world and all these, 
you know, uh, you know, you know, just um, terrible leadership, terrible place, isolated country that's out of touch with the rest of the world, that sort of thing. What did you see going to Eritrea? <laughs> we saw a lot um, in just a few days. I, I mean, I think that. I, if, if, I, if I had to say we saw one thing, I think it's that there's very few countries that are so aggressively ripped out of their context as what we saw in Eritrea. I think that you know, there's maybe a few other similar cases, and I would you know, encourage people to go see the video that Rania and I did, Why is Eritrea Being Demonized, where we address some of these questions before we ever went there, when you, know, you start to compare social indicators between Eritrea and other nations in Africa with similar development challenges, it looks very different than the way it does in the context of the mainstream media. It certainly doesn't look like the worst, that's for sure. And I think, you know, I've had the opportunity to travel in different places in Africa, different places in the developing world, and just from all of that together, I would say that it's just ripped terribly from its context. And none of the challenges that they have faced, I think, are really appropriately contextualized in the media that you get about it. And certainly anything positive that has ever happened there, you will never hear about and will forget being contextualized or decontextualized. It'll either be twisted to be demonized or it will just be not mentioned at all whatsoever. I mean, it's a relatively young country, 30 years. It is a developing country with a lot of development challenges. And in the time I was there, you know, people were not trying to hide that. It wasn't like it was, you know, some secret thing or whatever, that there are a lot of challenges that they're attempting to overcome. And that's a lot of the conversation there around the things you hear, around food sovereignty in Hungary, around access to water, around access to electricity. I mean, these are not you know, things that are whispered behind closed doors, but the ability of the country to make progress is on these questions and why not is certainly there. So that, I think, is maybe just one. I mean, and you can compare it and contrast it in different ways, and I think there's different ways to look at these things. I mean, you know, in Asmara, I will say that it is a very safe place. And certainly when you're out at night and different things, you don't really feel any, I mean, quite frankly, it's safer than most big cities in the United States. I mean, by a long shot. And certainly you get a very different feeling at night, but also other places in Africa. I mean, and this is no disrespect to Johannesburg. I love Johannesburg. Um, I love South Africa. But I remember I was in an Uber in Johannesburg, and we get to like the third stoplight, and the guy goes, hey, look, man, I hope you're not upset that I'm like not stopping at these stoplights. Uh, and I'm like, no, I'm not upset because you know, I mean, it wasn't rocket science, you know what I mean? If you stop, they were going to rob us. Uh, and, you know, hey, that's the nature of the social conditions and the deep social inequality, but that's like not an issue in Asmara. So there are many things you can say about it, but you certainly can not say that. Um, and I think sort of when you look at, or, you know, even just kids begging in the street, which is sadly, you know, something you see in many developing countries, that was significantly less significantly less, like to the point that if you've been to other parts of Africa, other parts of the developing world, it actually immediately stands out to you. Because if people say, oh, this is a super poor country, and there's poverty all over the place, the first thing I think most people will think is like, oh, there's going to be a lot of people out here begging, for sure. Um, now, whether or not that's even correct about developing countries, given what we see here in the United States of America, is a whole different issue, and also speaks to how we report developing nations as opposed to poverty in the United States of America, where you can see 100 people begging, and it's still considered the greatest, richest place on Earth. But anyway, leaving that aside for the time being, you know, there's a noticeable difference. Um, and so obviously, those are signs. Uh, you know, there's a relatively significant lack of income inequality. I mean, I reported from Haiti in March this year. And one of the wildest things when you're in Haiti is how the, there's like the roads are completely messed up all over Port-au-Prince um, to the point where it's like difficult to drive in different ways. But then it's just in the middle of nowhere, you'll just see a Porsche dealership. And you're just thinking to yourself, what? Like this is, I mean, like literally you feel like you're around, I mean, you're just around complete poverty, shameful poverty, because obviously it doesn't have to be that way. You know, tens of billions of dollars in wealth is being generated from Haitians every single year. So this enforced poverty, but you see this huge income inequality where people are living in these giant mansions, there's Porsche dealerships. I think like the nicest car I saw in Eritrea was like a 2017 Nissan truck. Um, 
and it might have been 2015. But I mean, it just gives you a sense, right? Like that there isn't these huge different gaps between you know haves and have-nots in the context of how it is. So you know, there's all these different things that I think, relative, especially to other developing societies in Africa, I think there's a lot to be said for what's happening there. I think there's a lot that other countries could potentially learn from, or at least should be in the conversation about how developing countries anywhere in the world, but certainly in Africa, are addressing these challenges. And again, I think everything's ripped from its context. I mean. And I think you'll see this, and I think this is hope hopefully a little bit of what will come out in our reporting where you know, we want to allow some people to speak for themselves, but you can look at the controversial issues like quote unquote national service, right? And it's always said, oh, well, you know, in, in Eritrea, everyone is like a slave and they have to stay in the military for like X number of years. And I don't want to get into the whole thing now and I don't want to you know, presuppose a lot of our reporting, but you think about a lot of countries around the world where generations, two generations of people now have been lost to mass unemployment. I actually remember in 2005 reading a study about Milwaukee in the United States where 50% of people under the age of 30 had no job. Uh, and it's not like those kind of things happen. So then in the context of a society that has free education for people and obviously has a lot of defense needs, but also is you know using its educated and trained people to support different developing aims in their society, I think that looks very different in that context, right? Um, but when it's ripped out of the context, you don't see it. So I think there's so many little things that we were able to see and get some insight into, even though it was just a few days, that show, I think, the primary thing for people to know over and above anything else the one thing that isn't going to help anyone in Eritrea is sanctions. That I can tell you for absolute certain. It's only going to hurt people. And no matter how targeted they say the sanctions are, it never works that way. It's always the more ambiguity you create around sanctions, the more people won't deal with the country, the worse it's going to get, it's only going to get worse. But I also think that it's a country that's ripped from its context. And I think that deserves to be placed in its right context compared to other nations that are facing similar challenges. And I think in that view, uh, it, it's it, it's much more charitable than what is seen now. So I, I mean, that's another country I encourage people to go to. You can travel there, you can see it for yourself. You don't have to believe me. I think people should go, they should see, they should get a sense of it because it's very, very different than the sort of worst of the worst, evilest place on earth kind of thing that you get in the mainstream media. That certainly, um, you know, is, 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 is not the right angle on the story. And just really quickly, and I think we're going to open it up to questions. I think what Eugene is speaking to, what I hear is be careful of, beware of that single story. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, if I'm saying it right, talks about this and has a whole TED talk about this sort of one narrative about a group or a country. Um, that is usually a good indication that you're not getting the right story, right? The fact that Eritrea is painted a certain way, but completely out of context. I, for a long time, was getting my information about Eritrea from the very sources that I now say are trash, right? So I, I, I would repeat certain things that I've heard um, in, in, in the mainstream media, and Eritrea is Ethiopia's closest neighbor, right? So beware of narratives that demonize your neighbors, that demonize people close to you that you have to live with. As much as possible, if you can try to get more of the story or another story, at least more than one story. Like for example, recently I've been talking about, you know, a lot of people when they talk about going somewhere in Africa, they'll say, oh, I went to Africa. And then you have to sort of follow up, okay, which country? Yeah. It's, a real, it's, a, it's a big continent, right? So those same sort of people or the kind of spirit of that um, is, so you take that and then all of a sudden, the U.S. cares down to the ethnicity of folks in Ethiopia. Now they are worried about protecting the Tigrayans in Ethiopia, and they have taken that lie and have helped sow divisions in the country that were not there before. People are intermarried. You can't even tell us apart. Like, there, <laughs> there, is, there is that... You just have to, uh, when, when people are trying to separate you from either your family members or your friends or your neighbors and demonize them, you have to know there's a larger um, ulterior motive. Really just simple, basic, um, personal example, and we'll move on to the questions. For example, if you have an issue with your family member, a parent or a brother that you're close to, that whatever the case, and you talk to one of your friends um, and they basically tell you, forget them, disown them, that's not a good friend, right? Because there's only so many parents or siblings that you have. So the same is true when someone's telling you to forget about the people that you share a country with. 
They're not doing it for you. A good friend would let you vent and then help you find a solution for that. And the West has been the opposite of that. And so I hope eventually Tigrayans, Ethiopians of other descent will realize when someone on the outside is telling you something negative of someone within, you have to question what their agenda is. And we've seen the devastating consequences of a people that get their ideas about their neighbors from a force way over there. Right, so I just wanted to add that and then we'll open up to questions. <laughs> One real quick thing I wanna to say too, I mean, because I agree with that 100%. I mean, I think it's also, how do we interrogate the phrases that are used? Like when we were in both countries, it's when, I don't even, well, did it happen? I don't know, the democracy summit that the US is having. And, you know, so Eritrea has a higher literacy rate than Pakistan. Pakistan was a part of the democracy summit. So, I mean, but is it, you know, is the right to read a democratic right? You know what I mean? So like, how are we even evaluating who was there? Or you look at how Zambia now has become the foil to Ethiopia, and they dropped Ethiopia from the MCC, and then they added Zambia, and they also invited Zambia to the democracy summit. But if you followed the election in Zambia, if you follow People's Dispatch, which is a great website which was following it, I mean, you know that there is all sorts of violent repression, very difficult repression, people are struggling to campaign, you can't even have house meetings in some cases without having the house surrounded by a bunch of you know, riot police, then you have to again ask yourself, like, what are all these different phrases and things that are being thrown at us to demonize a country, to say that this country, well, they're authoritarian, they're totalitarian, they're anti-democratic. Well, what do those things mean? I mean, if the United States has the most people in prison of any country on earth, that sounds relatively authoritarian to me. Um, you know, everywhere you go in every major airport, there's like National Guards people, go to Penn Station, walking around with assault rifles. But no one says, oh, America is like a police state. You know what I mean? Um, but then these things are turned around on other people where you know less about even your own reality. And I think it's important to interrogate a lot of these phrases. I think that's always an important thing anywhere I go and any trip I've ever taken reporting on how a lot of these things are thrown out to demonize countries, to demonize peoples and projects without any real sense of, again, context and proportion vis-a-vis -vis what we see in the West and other places that are allied to the West. Uh, great stuff, yeah, great stuff. Um, I, I think this is a great uh, time to open it up for Q&A. And so for anybody that has questions, just maybe raise your hand and we'll have a microphone going around. Um, oh. So right there in the front. Yeah. Make a technical adjustment here. Um, well, can I also just say, as negative as everything was, that, you know, I mean, I don't want people to only take away negative from the trip that we had in terms of breakthrough news. I think in different places and in different ways, we did see a lot of hopeful, hopeful things and hopeful pieces. So anyway, the mic is working now, but, you know, I did just want to add that because I think it all is always so negative that, you know, that's not the whole story necessarily. Either. Yeah, I, I'm just going to hold the mic to your face because I don't think we want a ton of people touching the mic if that's okay with people. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first, really, uh, Eugene, Simon, Hermela, really. Thank you very, very much for this in incredibly enlightening you know, presentation. I wish we could be 10 times more than this, but I'm sure you have, you'll have great opportunities. You know. So let me make one comment and then I'll ask a question. One comment is on the question of really the ethnicity that Hermela talked about. I think we, we have to really always emphasize why this ethnicity issue the so-called kind of ethnic cleansing, the, the fact that the grounds feel threatened, and so where did it start from? I mean, Ethiopia has a 2,000-year history. Not that everything was glorious, but we never had this issue of kind of a genocide and so on in the past. Why? It all started when TPLF instituted this apartheid ethnic system in 1991. And that should not be forgotten. I mean, it, it, they are the ones who created this, which everybody was saying that these are the seeds. They are really putting the seeds for a destruction in the future, and that's really what has happened over time. When someone lives from one from Tigray to quote unquote now Amara region, now you know that you're moving to a completely different area region. In the past, you're mo moving from Tigray to Wello, from Tigray to Bagemder. So what? In Wello, you'll have so many Tigrayans, others living. But now, distinctly, of course, you're, you're, 
you are leaving your region. You know, it's, it's this kind of division that they created over time. So obviously, when conflict happens, right, without any doubt, you know, the seeds of this kind of conflict leads to ethnic tension, so on. So just like the Western media does not talk about what is the origin of the current conflict, that the Northern Command was, it's always Abiy on November 4 sent his troops to Tigray. They don't, so the same thing about talking about eth ethnicity, they never talk about what is the origin. Why did the TPLF introduce this? And unless, unless that is changed, no, no other country in the world has a system that is based on ethnic federalism. I mean, here, all of us, today we are New Yorkers, tomorrow we can go to California and become Californians. We just, you know, there's no one that tells us, no, no, you're, you're, you're coming from this ethnic group, you cannot go there. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's, such, it's so basic and yet nobody asks it, you know. So I think, you know, in this whole discussion, I hope you'd raise this. What is the origin? Why did they introduce this? Why did they create the seeds of conflict right from the very beginning? Deliberately they did it. So that's kind of one comment. My question, next question, but my real question is, I think it was great that uh, Eugene, you went to Ethiopia. I wish you had stayed a bit longer, but <laughs> understandable, you have other things to do. Ramella, you'll be probably going soon, but again, you know, you're really doing a great job. The issue is, how do we break out of our circle? Because we are, I mean, what you say is great for us, you know. But we've got to, t to, to tell others what is happening, you know. We, we always used to say, ah, Fox News, you know, it has its captive audience, people who just don't listen to anything except Fox News. So, I mean, they just are totally, we thought that perhaps, you know, if, if you took up CNN, people are a bit more enlightened. As far as Ethiopians are concerned, whether it's CNN or Fox, it's one and the same. We thought that yesterday, Republicans were the ones who are just totally, you know, if the Democrats could come to power, to the administration becomes, we all voted, we all worked to elect Democrats, you know, what happens? The Democrats are, in fact, are the greatest mm -hmm. destroyers of Ethiopia right now. So, in one sense, it is more, it's, it's way beyond, you know, a label of a Democrat yeah. or this and so on. So my, my really point to you, uh, especially Eugene, is you have been in Ethiopia. You have seen very few, the Declan Walsh and so on, have not been. They just write. Is there any way that you can write to New York Times? As a journalist, you are a journalist, you know, I have been there. This is my story. Those of us who, can, who want to write, who, who send, nothing is published. They will never allow that. But I think you have a claim that as a journalist, you've gone there, you've seen it. And I think it's important if you could really write. Similarly, Harmela, Simon, and so on, really try to speak to different universities, to, to different audiences, to African-Americans. I mean, our African-American brothers, you know, I mean, we have got Gregory Mix, who is the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee here from New York has not been able, been willing to even talk to us. Just to say, can we at least right. see you? Mm -hmm. He wouldn't even see us. I think you'll have probably an opportunity to say, I have been there. I'm a New Yorker. Can I at least talk to you? It may not be in person, it may be in writing, but, but beyond BT, I'm right. saying, you really right. took, to get out yeah. and, and get, get this information out. Same thing about uh, Hermela. I mean, Mela Media, fantastic, but I know that you're, you're making the rounds and so on, but what is the way of getting out to the general public? To, because unless we influence the general public, sure. unless there is pressure from these people, they will continue doing what they are doing. So mm -hmm. again, really, thank you very, very much. It was really excellent, and we thank also the People's Forum for providing us this opportunity. Let me just tell you one more story. I, mean, I, well, I, I don't know if we can have you one more story. We had a few other people who had okay. hands. I, I appreciate you, but Thank we gotta. You. Thank you. We gotta police it a little bit. Great Do we want to take a few? Let's take a few before we come back around. Appreciate it, man. Hey, Jean. Hey, Mella. And hey, Simon. First, Jean, glad that you're here. That's one of the positive things that you made it back safe and that you didn't have to take Southwest as a flight. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, just real quick, the two questions I want to ask is, first for you, Jean, 
in terms of the percentage of the people that you interviewed and being in the country in terms of the level of support for Prime Minister Ahmed, for even the TVLF, and maybe any other people in the middle or any factions, what sense of percentage that you have for that? And for both of y'all, in regards to um, media colleagues like Nima El Jabbar, Declan Walsh, in regards to not only mentioning them on Twitter, in regards to holding them accountable in regards to colleagues for any bias or blatant information, but other ways in regards to any public forums, if they had interacted with you before, in terms of maybe trying to ignore, only that they couldn't ignore, in regards to how you have other ways to hold them accountable for any clear bias information that they have. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe let's take one more. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the conversation that uh, you had uh, on your visit to Ethiopia and Eritrea. I really appreciate it, and we hope to learn much more. Uh, before, um, I, I do want to ask you that there seems to be a concerted effort between what the mainstream media does and what the government's policy is. Is it deliberate? Is there uh, a natural symbiotic relationship between the two, or is it lazy journalism? So I want to know for that. I have my own views. I think uh, the US government will have a definitive plan to do X, Y, and Z in country X, and will have a narrative. It will share that narrative to the media, so the media can keep on repeating that. So in the case of Ethiopia, uh, they deliberately wanted to support TPLF, which is a minority government, and, and that is not unusual, because in most instances when we did a study in Africa for the 70s and 80s, the causes of conflict, usually what happens is that the previous colonialist government would pick a minority government, because that minority government is a, a sense of insecurity uh, within the population. So their, uh, their allegiance is with the outside power to stay, to stay in power. For instance, if we take the, the example of Rwanda, uh, the Belgians deliberately recruited and supported the Tutsis. And they also discriminated heavily against the Hutus. And that, over time, you know what has happened, 800,000 people were uh, killed in a very short period of time, which by the way was not widely covered in this media because it was not in US's interest uh, to support that particular case. So I want to know just your views about the relationship between the media and the state on whether it is just the media doing their own thing and being lazy and being unprofessional. Thank you. So much. <laughs> I'll cover a little bit of ground and then I'll let the guys um, step in. Um, I would, what I've gathered, uh, that panel that we did on Saturday with the reporters with the Middle East, or from the Middle East, Haitian journalists, et cetera, what the Middle East veteran war journalists said, and I think it's true, is mainstream media is state, gov state media, essentially. When it comes to foreign media, I think your last uh, hypothesis about uh, they decide they want to do something in a certain country, and then they agree on the narrative, and they just push that narrative. So Declan Walsh of New York Times, he's, he's working closely with the government. You, ha you have to, to be able to get certain data anyway, right? So he gets this exclusive look at certain documents. Why? Because he is writing the story that they want him to write. And then I think the lazy part, so there's the intentional tier, of mainstream media, so they're like the, the people that are in, with, uh, working closely with the government. And then there's everybody else that uses their work as a reference point. So every time I go on a, um, you know, a, a, a channel that is here in the West, even with all this new data that has come out in the last several months, what they read into me coming on is all old recycled stuff. You can't keep talking about a blockade when we know that a lot of aid has gone in. 
you can't keep saying genocide when there has not been enough evidence to say that, right? So everybody else, because I you know, worked in the news industry for a long time, the funding is, um, uh, uh, is being uh, diluted and because of new media, et cetera, they basically have one writer writing eight stories, right? So they're just taking the AP wire, slapping it together. So the lazy part is, is the, the uh, result of the propaganda sources. So people use UN as sources, but UN is so problematic, right? They're not, they're not all bad, but they're also not, they don't hold their people accountable. So when, they're, when UN officials are being accused of literally helping armed insurgents, you now have to start questioning everything that comes out of uh, the UN. And then I wanna hit one more point before I pass it on to um, Simon and um, I almost said Nebu, uh, <laughs> Eugene. So what I found in news, and this is the really frustrating part, even in the work that I've done, is they always tell you the what, but they don't tell you the why. So I worked it, as a reporter in LA for three years. So we, we have a huge homelessness problem. We have 100,000 people in LA um, that are homeless. And it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's people on the street that are literally rotting away uh, uh, because of addictions, mental health issues that have, some of it has started from being homeless. So we do all these stories being like, look at all these people, they're, they're not, it's they're, they're so sad, it's so sad. Okay, the city collects a hundred and million dollars for the homelessness issue last year. We don't say what's being done with that money because the why is the cost of living is going up, the money that the city and the county is collecting for, um, to help homeless people isn't going there. It is going to these consultants and, and these developers, these units that are $750,000 a unit that is coming from that hundred um, uh, is it million, does that sound right? That's yeah, right. yeah, hundred million dollars that we collected the year before, right? So as long as they don't tell you the why, you will never get to the solution. So they'll tell you a war is happening. If they don't tell you the why, then you don't know the solution. So it's, it's sort of what seems to be a mainstream media tactic to make you feel like you're informed, but they don't really give you the tools to actually solve it, right? So it's, it's so sophisticated because it makes you think you know what's going on, but it doesn't empower you. It, it does the opposite of that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, li literally to break through, yeah. right? Is that <laughs> the right way to? <laughs> He'll be here all weekend, folks. Little, no, no, no. Not a comedy panel. No, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think that we chose the name deliberately for that reason, because I think, I mean, I actually have had an op-ed in the New York Times before, so you never know, anything is possible. But I think even that is very limited, right? Like they'll give you one and then a hundred other articles that are there. So I think the challenge that really, I think it's sort of a cart before the horse problem because I agree 100%. I mean, none of these problems can be resolved if the broad masses of people are not engaged to want to make change and make a difference. But the mainstream media is in many ways, not, not many ways, 100%, not designed to really be a vehicle for the masses of people to gain the appropriate level of information and be engaged. And I think that's why sort of, I, mean, I don't even like to call it even alternative media, but quote unquote alternative media. I think the bigger question for us is how do we build our audience outside of the people who already know? Because ultimately, Ultimately, we can't depend on anyone else to tell this story, and part of the reason we aren't reaching the mainstream is because even when you can get in, it's in such a limited sense and such a narrow reality that you can only kind of barely tell the story. I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing quickly about this. I remember once I got invited on, well, headline news, but CNN, whatever, to talk about um, Syria. This is in like 2013, maybe, um, right after the U.S. had bombed Syria and there had been a protest in front of the White House that I had been at against the U.S. bombing of Syria. So I get this call from the producer and they were like, we really want you to come on. This is so great. It's our morning show. It's like, we're going to be on, we're going to have you on for 20 minutes. We're going to have this whole conversation. And I'm thinking, well, this honestly sounds a little too good to be true. And as they say, everything that sounds too good to be true is. But anyway, I get on there and the first question they ask is, why are people opposed to the bombing in Syria? To be honest with you, it's so long ago, I can't actually remember what I said, but all I remember is, is maybe like a three minute answer, is the second I was done, the anchor goes, and you know what, that's a great note to end on, we really appreciate you having, having you on. And I was like, wow, what happened to the 20 minute conversation we were supposed to have? This is headline news, I know you guys, what else are you talking about, home and garden? I don't know, but um, 
no disrespect to gardening or taking care of your home. But uh, you know, it was it was just it just shows that there's so many. We I, I agree. I think we need to try to get into the mainstream whenever we can, however we can, whatever it takes. Um, you know, I was proud to be a signatory on a ad that was bought in the New York Times called Let Cuba Live that was trying to reach people there. So I think whether it's writing op-eds, whether it's buying ads, whether it's talking to journalists, we should not give up on that. But I do think we have a huge question of, of, of how we build sort of our own media base amongst people who want information and don't know. And I think that's the only way to really hold the mainstream accountable, right? Is for there to be some sort of counter narrative out there. I mean, you, I, I'll give you another example from something I saw. You know, the issue of the fake aid caravan into Venezuela a few years ago from Colombia, where the Venezuelan right wing burned their own aid trucks and then tried to blame it on the government. But there were so many people on social media that were just, I mean, it was obviously on video, them like torching the thing. But anyway, you could see it so que clearly that it did change the narrative. And ultimately, even though they let a little time lag so they didn't get embarrassed, then you had the New York Times and the Washington Post come out and say, oh, well, you know what? The story wasn't what they said it was. And it wasn't because they wanted to tell the truth, but it was because there was such a counter narrative existing out there that they couldn't really continue to exist in a way without in some way, shape, or form acknowledging the fact that the sort of mainstream narrative, the one they'd pushed on the day, was not in fact true. So I mean, I don't know if we'll ever hold them accountable 100%, because to some degree they're accountable to who they need to be accountable to, um, and who's paying the bills there, and you know the preconceived notions of the people who consume it. But I think it does at least create sort of a bar for accountability um, that is there. And, and I'll just say quickly too to the point of, and I think this is just building on what you're saying. I think it's both deliberate and the, in a way like lazy journalism on these issues is deliberate, right? Um, I think we'd be very naive if we didn't look at the history of the fact that the CIA and others have very often deliberately manipulated the media and we've seen that it's documented it's known but i think this is something that's been brought up you know by many different people i mean obviously you know noam chomsky in manufacturing dissent but it's also been brought up by robert mcchesney in a book called the political economy of the media michael parenti that to some degree like just the very fact that people are willing to accept certain biases from certain sources. Like if the New York Times said it, if the State Department said it, if these people said it, then it must be true. Like I don't really need to corroborate it anymore because why would they lie? Why would they do all this? Like that in and of itself is baked into journalism as a profession. What you can, should consider legitimate, what shouldn't be considered legitimate. And that's kind of baked into the education you get, not just as a journalist, not just in college, but in high school, in middle school, in elementary school, in terms of what sources, what people are held up as legitimate. And I think the preconceived notions and biases that make people say, these are legitimate, credible sources, builds into a lot of that lazy journalism, but that's not really an accident. It's exactly what they think they should be doing because of the definitions they've been given of credibility uh, and other pieces like that. So um, yeah, the final question was just about what sense we got uh, of different forces. You know, it's tough to say. Uh, one thing I can say is, it, it, from everything I saw, there's very little support for the TPLF outside of their core base, that's for sure. And a lot of people with many other differences are definitely united against the TPLF. And that's one thing that I think is notable, is that the sort of hatred of the TPLF and the uh, opposition to the offensive tends to be a bridging factor over a lot of different other pieces that are there. I think there's a lot more to be said about that. Um, I think there's obviously a lot that's been happening since 2018 in terms of the relationship of forces. I think obviously there's a broader conversation about national reconciliation going on. So there's, I think, I don't really want to speak to it 100%, but one thing I can say is that opposition to the TPLF does seem to be something that transcends a lot of different beliefs and feelings um, around, you know, Abiy Ahmed, the government now, where Ethiopia should go in the future. A lot of people are willing to say, whatever we disagree on that, we're definitely 100% opposed to the TPLF. So obviously they have some support, but it seems relatively minimal. And to a large degree, I think the fact that the course of the war seems to be turning back against them at least seems to be a reflection of what we saw there on the ground, which is that there is quite a bit of opposition. Um, I think uh, a, a very important sort of topic that we haven't talked about that is related to some of these questions, uh, in particular we're talking about um, accountability. Um, maybe, Hermela, maybe you can kind of talk about no more um, and what it has been doing in terms of accountability, holding the media accountable, holding the U.S. government accountable. Um, you know, do you, Maybe just give us a, a, some background on what is no more, and and what, how does it play into this whole idea of accountability? 
So you know there's, I don't know where it comes from, but there's a line that says the truth speaks for itself. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. If it did, the narrative around Ethiopia would have been corrected a long time ago. So one of the things that I've learned in this time is, and it goes back to what Eugene was touching on about having sources that are telling your story um, in order to push back against the mainstream media. So really no more came out of initially just to what can we do to start balancing out the narrative about this conflict at the same time commemorating the anniversary of the war. And some of us were talking and just sort of trying to figure out what the hashtag was and just sort of what can actually express that sentiment and we landed on no more and sort of trying to figure out or, or explain uh, clarifying what are, what are we saying when we say no more? No more false narratives, no more um, stereotyping countries. Like in any other Western country, the fact that a group attacked a military base, it's it. Like that's it. That's the end of the story, right? In this case, because I guess it's an African country or whatever the case, there's all this mental gymnastics that happens to justify why that was okay. Well, there was a buildup of soldiers, the government, da da da. So I think that, um, you know, we, we were sort of just trying to be aggressive and being the voice of the truth because you realize if you don't do the work, it's not going to get done. Mainstream media has to be forced to tell a different alternative story. And it goes back to, um, at some point, I would like to start referring to mainstream media as like government media or state media because it goes back to language. You legitimize something. Okay, they're mainstream and everybody else is alternative. Well, the truth is some of them are literally state media. In a different country, you would call that state media. In Ethiopia, every media channel there is called state media, whether they're really state media or not, right? So I think that... Um, Really, really pushing back and pushing back in a qualitative, substantive way. I think that Ethiopia has a long way to go in terms of doing some strong journalism. So one of the frustrations that um, I have with some of the, uh, the the media there is, you know, even folks that are really trying to do the right work, I see them interviewing IDPs, etc., and they don't go all the way in on the questions. They kind of do surface level and they, they back out. And there's something about, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or a language thing, it's very modest, it's not you know, very initially expressive, these people have been traumatized as well, so you have to pull the data out of them and you gotta be specific. So doing one story, I ask a million questions on a, on a given day. On something this big, reporters in Ethiopia, media have to be very diligent about getting all the details about a story, right? That is what helps you gain credibility. If you're doing some vague, like, you know, vague work, even I go, I, what, is that, is that true? I, I can't, I cannot repeat that story because I'm not confident in the way that you um, investigated it. So ultimately what it is is people have to take part in telling their story. The struggle with Ethiopia is we did not have that media infrastructure in place that was done well, that was, um, you know, that had a global stage to be able to push back. All you saw is people on social media frust being frustrated, being like, that's not true. Okay, so what is true? And you need to package it in a way that someone who only just kind of cares can put a, can take a couple of minutes and see a story as opposed to having to watch something that's an hour or two and the quality is kind of questionable. Um, so I think that the future is that these alternative spaces, and, and I've seen a lot of young folks, young folks um, from Ethiopia and Eritrea really get engaged in these rallies and they're started social media pages, they're writing articles, they're producing videos. Would have been nice to have had this 10 years ago. This might have been a lot uh, more a lot easier, but better late than never. I think in the future, it won't be so difficult to push back on the sort of propagandized narratives. Um, and I think uh, both of our guests tonight are not only journalists, uh, I think it's safe to say, um, they're both organizers in addition to this, whether they like it or not. Uh, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a very important aspect when we're talking about accountability, the type of journalism that you do, and then, you know, uh, um, 
coordinating that with organizing. And so we know, uh, Eugene, you have been a longtime organizer uh, with the Answer Coalition, and you've done some amazing work. Um, and so now, looking at No More, um, and some of the things that have kind of emerged since the start of the campaign, um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, a, a, it's what appears to be a legitimate movement, I, I think it's maybe safe to say. You can kind of, uh, you know, give your impressions. But um, what do you see in No More, um, and what can you imagine happening moving forward, viewing it as a work of coalition building? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> I could go on all day about what I see in it. That's a good question. I, I mean, I think that, you know, it's definitely a real movement. There's no doubt about that. All you got to do is see the momentum behind it, both on the streets and, and online, and that's unequivocal. I think, obviously, it's helping to drive a broader conversation, not just really around the Horn of Africa, per se, but I think also refocusing people on the issue of how the U.S. government is operating in Africa as a continent. Um, and I think you can already see, like, even in the context of sort of the no more hashtag, when there was the blocking of the French military convoy in Burkina Faso, then later in Niger, that like also blew up on the no more hashtag, even though it was sort of on the other side of the continent. But you could see how just the sort of focus in the Horn of Africa has really helped, not just around no more, but I think other people who are looking at issues of imperialism on the African continent, uh, focus the conversation to there in a way that it hasn't been in a long time. I'll say that much, you know. I don't want to speculate on when, but it hasn't been in a long time. And I think that's very useful because I think when we talk a lot about the sort of myths about the African continent, the dark continent myth, it's that also that nothing that happens in Africa is news. And I think that no more has helped sort of upend that. I think that obviously in the context of the political situation in the United States, that it has resonated in a way that has made it into the quote unquote mainstream. And that is in the conversation around what is going to happen with the two major political parties. Now, that being said, I mean, I think these are some of the questions that, are, of course, are confronting it. I mean, the reality is, is that whether they were Democrats or Republicans, the US government was supporting the TPLF. And some of the worst things they did were on the watch of the Republicans and vice versa. I always remind people, don't forget it was Trump who said that it would be right for Egypt to bomb the dam. And so you know, there's a huge consistency here, I think, across the two major political parties. So it's also coming up against one of the major questions that all movements come up against in the context of the United States is like, who are your friends and who are your enemies? And especially going into next year, which is an election time, you know, it's always the off year. It's like the Democrats in 2000, 2007, you know, passed some bill. Of, it's a long story going back to it, but it was basically like a allegedly like an anti TPLF bill that's supposed to hold them responsible for quote unquote human rights. And then, of course, when they came in, they did the exact same thing the Bush administration had been doing. And in fact, when you read WikiLeaks, they're actually talking about how, well, we don't know, there's such an irrational fear amongst the government, you know, Mellis and his friends, um, that they're, we're going to care more about human rights. And we keep telling them, no, no, we don't really care. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what they're saying. But, you know, now everyone is going to be a friend of each. Ethiopia next year, right? Democrats in primaries, Republicans in different places, and they're all going to be saying, oh, we're going to do this for Ethiopia, we're going to do that for Ethiopia. They aren't. Um, because, you know, you just look at what they're doing now. The bills in Congress to sanction Ethiopia are 100% bipartisan. The policy of hostility against the dam and against the peace deal between Ethiopia and Eritrea, 100% bipartisan policies. So at the end of the day, I think it's also a challenge. And every movement faces this consistently in the United States of the fact that there's also no real independent politics that's independent of this imperialist foreign policy, that's independent of a you know, pro-profit over people mindset. And so you get a big movement, you get things happening, and people think, oh, we got this person in, and something's going to happen. I mean, you know, look, last year, we had the largest uprising against racism in the history of the country, and not one substantive bill has been passed to address anything at any level in any part of the country to address issues of police terrorism, police violence, racism in prisons. I mean, just nothing happening, despite the fact that 27 some odd million people took to the streets. So I think there's also a question that this is leading to is, if you have a real movement, and you have been able to break into the conversation to some degree, and you obviously have the wherewithal within the base of people who are already active to make a difference, how do you make that difference substantive and not just ephemeral? And I think that's a big question that will be coming up in the coming 
months, in the coming weeks, and in the coming year, I think not to allow the movement to get sidetracked and to be able to make the difference that it did, which was coming out into the streets, people being heard, um, and speaking for themselves, and not allowing some other political actor to speak for them. But I think that in many ways, and I'll just close with this, it has also been a very hopeful moment, I think, to see a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds come together. I mean. It's maybe not lost to a lot of people here, but to some people who don't know the issue, to have Ethiopians and Eritreans having conversations, coming together, protesting in the street, waving each other's flags, talking, communing, coming to each other's community centers and having events, things that you know, for many people have probably never happened before. Even just the initial step in some of those conversations I think is huge. And it's potentially you know, a game changer, certainly for diasporic communities here. But I think it's also an opportunity for people in this country to learn more about what's going on in other parts of the world, not only to show their solidarity, but to then build deeper links with communities that perhaps they have been alienated from. You know, I lived in DC for 15 years. Anyone who's lived in DC knows that the Ethiopian and Eritrean American community is huge. But by and large, you don't, nece you don't necessarily have a lot of intercourse. You might know, oh, hey, there's a lot of Ethiopians in DC, but how many do you really know? How many are you doing? No more, I think, has created the spaces and the base basis for more of those conversations, too, which I think is interesting and positive and, and has a lot of interesting potentialities for you know, where politics in this country can go. And I think what I'll, yep, clap it up. <laughs> That was a sermon, amen. Um, so uh, one of the things that, you know, to me, uh, that No More is about is, because when we were talking about what we were gonna do, you know, there was an inclination to make it about Ethiopia, Eritrea, maybe that's the hashtag, and it was just like, it didn't feel right, it felt narrow, there were larger value-based issues that go beyond this country, um, and, and I never wanted to be like an Ethiopian activist because you know I was born there, grew up there until I was seven, lived with so many different types of people. I didn't even like the optics of people um, that I know, friends and colleagues, see, you know, seeing what I was saying on social media and thinking like, does she only care about Ethiopia? To me, it was more the value issue. Like you guys say this is journalism, and it's not. So there could be any other country that's facing this if I knew enough about it or if I was engaged enough for whatever different reasons, I would feel the same way. So I think that this also speaks to, you can't just care about it when it comes to your community, right? One of the things I've noticed as a reporter is most protests, and I think Black Lives Matter has, has broken this, this pattern, um, only include the people in that community. So there's a war in Ethiopia, just Ethiopians show up. There is a, a, a police shooting, not usually, like I said, with Black Lives Matter has changed that, but for a long time it was just like, black folks just showed up, right? There's something that's going on um, in the Middle East or Syria, just Syrians show up. That's not, it doesn't, a women's issue, only women show up, right? So it's, it's ultimately, in this, goes back to um, what the gentleman was asking about ethnicity. You, I don't believe in anything that is black and white based on something you can't even choose, right? What that does, when you, when you paint one ethnicity with one stroke or the other, and it's human tendency to do that because it's an easier way of sort of ordering the world. Who's bad, who's good? Tell me, just like basically that, that tells you that, right? What that does is it leaves space for the bad actors, the folks that aren't honest, that are not for you, to come in just because they fit that profile and, and do so much more damage than somebody that's from like the opposite end, right? So it's, it really just gives way for the worst of people to take charge. Why? Because they just tell you what you want to hear. You, you know, you, you want to hear Tigrans is it, are this, right? So they'll just tell you that, regardless of whether it's going to be good for you or not. Um, and so I think the, the crossover of social justice issues, to me, seems so important for any real change to happen. And it goes beyond ethnicity, it goes beyond gender, and then nation, nations. And I, and I, you know, I will give this to everybody, it's a lot of work to figure out what's going on in another country, who's really on the right side of things when you have so much working against you. But I think spaces like this is the beginning, or I'd say the continuation um, and, uh, of that sort of effort, what the People's Forum is doing, what Answer Coalition is doing. It's not, 
it's not choosing any sort of identity to back. It's bringing p together a group of people that have similar values, and that I think is a much stronger link and relationship than just Democrats, Republicans, black votes, whatever. Like, that's just not gonna go very far, in my opinion. So, thank you, amazing. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're at time, and I really wanna thank our guests today, uh, who, again, are both journalists doing amazing work, um, and honestly, saving lives and opening a lot of eyes and um, you know their time is very precious they're both very busy individuals and so um, we just want to thank them and everybody let's just give them a, a round of applause for giving us their time uh, I, and I also want to thank the People's Forum uh, and all these all the sponsors of this event Answer Coalition uh, Breakthrough News New Africa Institute I guess uh, low plug uh, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I think we, um, we have a little something for our guest today uh, from community members here, I think, who, uh, you know, wanted to show a little bit of, uh, uh, a little bit of love. So um, can I give you the mic? Uh, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you to uh, the People Forum for uh, uh, arranging this stage for us and inviting us to meet this great two people, Ethiopian and a friend of Ethiopian. We really, uh, it, it's really great for us to be here and to listen to this wonderful people. We thank you for that. Uh, Eugene, you are working, I'm, I'm not a public speaker, but I'm trying to speak okay. something. <laughs> you are working beyond and above for Ethiopia and all Africa. We really thank you for that. We really want you to do that in the future. <laughs> we appreciate it. We hope you're going to do it again and again. Uh, uh, Hermela, you are a voice for voiceless Ethiopia. You are also a loud, loud voice for Ethiopia. We just cannot get enough of you. Always, always, we are appreciating what you are saying, what you are doing for our country. We really appreciate that. People cannot get enough of you. We cannot get enough saying thank you, thank you, thank you, always thank you. We really appreciate that. So, so we just brought a little gift for uh, Hermela and, uh, and uh, our good friend Eugene. No, no, get this. No, that's not actually so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Thank also, you. also, uh, I know Hermela has a lot of 1,000 flags in, in her house, but I just want to make a Eugene Ethiopian oh. for just a <laughs> 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 Thank, uh, Also, All right. also, also uh, uh, Simon, you are a good friend of us. You are a very good friend of Ethiopian community people. Uh, we really appreciate what you are doing for us. Uh, for tonight, all we have to say is we love you. Thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. I'll share my flowers. <laughs> thank you, it's so sweet. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out and uh, be safe tonight.